look at the subject of, of dealing with um, research and data management. And Jessica, if I, I think you um, are recording, so sorry I didn't mention that. <laughs> um, I am Jeremy Kenyon. I'm a research librarian here at the University of Idaho. I'm the library's liaison to the College of Natural Resources, so some of my examples might be a little bit oriented that way, um, but um, I think they're more generally applicable as well. Uh, and for a number of years now, about seven years, I've been a data steward with the U.S. Geological Survey, so I've had a lot of experience working with scientists and researchers uh, with their data management issues and uh, presenting that data, publishing it, and dealing with a lot of different uh, fields and different topics. So if you have questions relevant to yours, I uh, might encourage you to, to ask questions uh, towards the end. So today we are going to talk a little bit about organizing and doing data management in the context of a research project or any kind of research activity uh, that you're engaged in. We're going to cover uh, a number of different topics. We're going to kind of do a survey over a lot of different things. Um, you know, we're not going to deep dive in any of these too, too far or to too much of an extent. Um, if you have any questions, certainly ask. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about workflows, about data formats and issues of volume, uh, that is a size or amount of data. We'll talk about data dimensionality and how that relates to formats and structures that you might want to be thinking about. We'll talk about storage options and some of the issues to think about in that context. Um, backing up your data and reliability and how to ensure uh, long-term uh, security of the data you're working with. Um, we're gonna talk about file organization and file naming as well. So how do we actually organize the contents of our folders and files and things like that? And what are some tips and principles for doing that? So we're gonna kind of get into all of these different areas. And um, like I said, let me know if you have more questions. So I'm going to start by just introducing you to sort of the notion of data management. Um, when we talk about it, we are talking about a process that has a number of different steps. Um, this is kind of a simplified version. And just as an example, you see on the graphic here uh, from left to right, from the uh, blue symbol on the left to the blue symbol on the right, a really basic idea of a research process. You collect some data at one end, you go through the process of cleaning it, of analyzing it, and then eventually you produce something on the other end um, that you're going to share it through a manuscript or put into a report or turn in as an assignment or whatever the case may be. Um, of course, if you've done research in any, to any extent in the past, you know that this is not always uh, a process that's quite so linear. Sometimes it's very nonlinear. So, you get to a certain stage and then you have to go back and do something else and you kind of cycle through some of these steps over and over again. Um, with that in mind, sort of, we like to try to break this into these four big categories to start thinking about some of the issues of storage and organization and so on. And so the first one is just the idea of data collection. So this isn't just bringing in new data from outside and starting a project, it's also data that you produce towards the end of your project is data that needs to be ingested into your data management system. Um, where you store things, how you protect it, uh, how you document it, and so on. And so collection, you keep coming back to that. You keep coming back to the question of how do I take this data and put it into my system? Um, storage is where we're gonna spend a lot of time today because that's kind of the, the core of where are you putting it, how are you organizing it there, and how are you keeping track of it over time and, and preserving it so you don't lose it? Um, no matter what stage in this process you're at, you're always dealing with the questions of describing and documenting the data you produce. And when we say data, we might also include um, code for doing analyses, and maybe you know, ancillary documents like notes that you collect, other kinds of things. You're always, you're always creating these files and these um, parts of your overall research project. And it's often a very good idea when you're producing those to put them in your data management system, but then also to make sure they're documented and described. Um, things like notes, sort of self-explanatory, data sets or graphics, you might actually have to create some kind of accompanying metadata that describes what that is, where it came from, who created it, under what context, 
Um, especially that's the case if you're working with a team of people and different people are doing different things. Um, it's a really good way of, of making sure you're all aware of what's going on. And then lastly is the, the fun part, the application and use of the data um, to generate a variety of different things. Um, and so again, when you generate those things, you have to move it back into your data management system and preserve it there over time. So these are just the kind of big categories. And as we go, we'll, we'll talk about more details um, of each. You know, one of the things when you're starting a project that you're gonna wanna do is to think through your data strategy a little bit. And so a workflow diagram is a really useful way of doing that but it also gives us a chance to ask some key questions about how we're gonna manage data, how we're gonna manage files, where we're gonna put them as we go. And so this is another example um, from data one of uh, just a basic um, research project where somebody's dealing with a little bit of temperature data and salinity data. Uh, they're gonna use R to analyze it. And these are the steps they're anticipating going through. And so even if you don't obviously know the outputs of your research, that's why you're doing research, you probably have a pretty good idea of the steps you're, you're likely to go through. And so this gives us a way to just sort of organize our thoughts and look at some of the issues involved. Um, so all the blue symbols there are examples of output data sets. So actual files that you'll save somewhere in some format, um, independent of the process steps that you're going through. And then the green, of course, is the actual process. Uh, and in this case, most of that's probably R code of some sort um, that they're working with. And so we can look at this and say, okay, for each of those blue symbols, you know, um, where are these gonna live? Where are we gonna put these things? Um, where am I gonna store them? Uh, what formats should all of these be in? Should my, you know, summary statistics be in an R format? Should they be in a CSV? Uh, what's the case? Uh, what do I need to produce? Um, that second step you see there, quality control and data cleaning, gives you an opportunity to think a little bit ahead of time. What steps am I going to do to clean or check the data uh, before I start running it through analysis? So in a lot of different fields, there are basic protocols for doing data checks, looking at the ranges um, for numerical values or checking to make sure that everything is conforming to some code that you may have been using in your, that you plan to use in your data analysis. Um, so going through those, uh, this is a good way of, of just checking and, and seeing where you're at. And then if you know kind of what types of analysis you want to do, again, this is a way to say, okay, do I have the right format for the tool that I plan to use? Um, in all data analysis and data science, there is a wide range of tools that we can, we can deploy to achieve our goals. Some of them do many of the same things. So whichever one you're planning to use, this is something you can use to think through kind of the inputs and outputs of using that tool. You can get more complex with your workflows if you want to. Um, you, can go, you can go too far, in my opinion, if you want. Um, this is just an example of, of something that's a little more complex. Um, the, main, the main difference here, of course, is the uh, four uh, symbol in the center. And so if you think of that as iteration for every row in my, my spreadsheet, can we compile a list of unique um, species uh, tax or species names. Um, and similarly, can we generate counts for latitude and longitude coordinates? Can we figure out the range of this species given all of our, our observations of it um, and so on? I would say this is a perfectly uh, good diagram, except for one thing. If you compare it to the one just before, in this example, we had a lot of intermediate data sets being produced. So these were uh, data sets that essentially kind of saved your work at various stages. So as you go through, you've got a copy of it that you can look back on and check. Um, in this example, it may just be a, an error in the diagram. You don't see a lot of those. So I would, I would expect to see one after the QAQC procedures to see if they're a cleaned up data set before we go into the analysis. And then of course, for each of these branches, there's probably some output data sets as well. <clears throat> So thinking through this process can give you a lot of um, ways of figuring out how to solve problems before they come up.
So thinking just uh, briefly and generally about data formats, of course, many different fields use lots of different formats for lots of different reasons. Uh, I'm gonna really just focus on one sort of key distinction today, which is the difference between what I'm referring to as fancy files here versus very simple files. And fancier files are things that come with, for example, Microsoft programs that come with um, uh, proprietary analysis software of some sort. Uh, they're usually files that have all the data, but then they also have a lot of overhead that is designed to communicate information to the application in question to tell it how to use that data. Um, often those files are larger and they take up more space on your, in your storage system than other kinds of files. If you're dealing with a really small project, that probably doesn't matter too much. Um, but if you've got a, a big project with a lot of data, uh, the more complicated the file type, the bigger your data often will end up being. Simpler files usually are cleaner, um, there's fewer issues associated with, say, character encoding, and often they're often <laughs> they're more accessible to other tools and systems. And so, simple files like like an ASCII text file or a CSV are typically written as open specifications. In other words, they're open source. Uh, anybody can get the the basic elements of of what that format looks like, and then when they build a tool, they can make it able to read that kind of file. And so when you use open formats, you're using uh, formats that are accessible to the, to the widest range of tools, which is both good for you, but it's also potentially good for people you're working with sharing. Um, this uh, useful diagram here from the University of Illinois kind of gives us an idea of the preservation issues associated with data formats. The stuff on the left um, is typically proprietary, and because of that, um, it, it, they can be difficult to access at later dates. Um, a good example of this is there were a lot of people that generated Word documents in the 90s and things like WordPerfect. Well, today, <laughs> WordPerfect doesn't really exist anymore. Um, and so until recently, it was kind of a pain every time somebody gave you an outdated format like that. The formats on the right, generally, things like CSV, uh, ASCII text, TIFF for images, uh, XML files, things like that are um, pretty widely uh, used and their probability of being reusable in the future and their ability to be preserved by organizations like libraries and repositories um, is significantly higher. Uh, there's a few kind of special formats like PDF and shapefiles um, used in GIS that actually started as proprietary but have actually transitioned to becoming open specifications. And so PDFs and shapes and shape files in certain formats or certain styles are, um, are very good formats to use as well. So uh, yeah, think a little bit about what you're producing and why you're producing it. If your issue is kind of long-term reuse and preservation either by yourself over time or by team members or by other people, um, think kind of more towards the, the open or the more open format. That's a, that's a more useful one for everybody. I, I want to talk a little bit um, with that in mind about this sort of notion of uh, dimensionality in data. Because often when people talk about data management, there's a certain amount of people that want to talk about file organization and you know, where do you store stuff. And other people want to talk about you know, when do I use a spreadsheet, when do I use a database. And so we'll, we'll kind of touch on a little bit of both in this session um, by talking about this. Um, when we talk about data dimensionality, we're talking about the, the way your data can take on or can have lots of different ways of looking at it based on what you're trying to, to um, analyze. And so if we take, for example, a sort of simple spreadsheet or table of core facts or variables of interest. So let's say we're, an, we're observing animals out in the wild or we're collecting survey data from, from human beings. You know, you have your basic elements of whatever it is that you're, you're tracking. So in this example, you know, we're looking at the weight or the length or some kind of a marker of a behavior associated with that animal. But there might be other kinds of things that you're interested in, other dimensions or groups of variables that you're, related, you're interested in that are related to that fact. So it might be um, time, different elements of um, day, month, week, year, et cetera. 
space. There may be specific environmental variables associated with that location as opposed to another location. Um, there may be observer or instrument information you want to capture, like who collected this and when did they collect it and under what conditions did they collect it, et cetera. Um, so there may be a lot of other dimensions that make your data more complicated. And as you get more of those, uh, a simple spreadsheet stops being so effective and efficient for um, representing that data and being able to analyze and query it. So one of the things to sort of understand about this is the lower the number of dimensions you're using, the easier it is to use a spreadsheet. Uh, and often that's a pretty good default if you kind of don't know where to start. You know, would your data look good in a spreadsheet? Would that work effectively? But as you add more and more dimensions, you're going to need to think in terms of more uh, ways of managing it and controlling it. Um, so relational databases and database systems um, start becoming useful things here. And examples of relational databases are like Microsoft Access, which is really popular for that. Um, there's also an open source tool called SQLite, which is a very simple, small relational system you can use. Um, and let me show you an example of kind of thinking a little bit about some of these, these issues. We've got, a, uh, we've got a sample data set that is made up of three spreadsheets. We've got one of plots, so these are plot locations. Let me pull that over for a given um, location. We've got uh, species data here, which is what, it, what you think it is, what it looks like. And then we've got uh, surveys. And so these are observations of animals at a given point in time. Uh, and they are referenced to the other tables by plot ID and by species ID. And so, you know, in this case, we've got 35,000 observations or so in this, in this data set. This is actually, you know, quite a lot to, to, to look at and work with. But I wanted to point out a couple of things. Number one, um, the file size. So we talked a little bit about formats and volume. Um, if we look at surveys here, we'll see that it's about a megabyte in size, and the other two are pretty negligible. When we combine those all into one, so we get rid of the separation between them, we combine all the data into the same folder, we get this combined one, um, it looks like this. So we have all that duplicative information stored in our spreadsheet. But the volume of that spreadsheet now expands up to three megabytes. So it grows as we, we duplicate information within the spreadsheet itself. And so as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, more and more observations, the spreadsheet starts to become less and less of an effective solution to the problem. Um, if we take all of this, and, and I won't go into it on this in this session, but if we take all of this and we put it into a database file, now the first thing I'll point out is it's 968K. So it's less than a megabyte, and it's all the same information that's in this three megabyte file right here. So the database is more efficient and easier to, to store all of that information. Um, this is a, a, a way of looking at this particular data set. And you'll notice that we've got all of our same tables stored in this. And we've done it with, with essentially a, a compressed um, file type, uh, this database file type. So uh, there is some cost to that. So you're going to have to learn how to query it and, and all that kind of stuff. But it does present some benefits um, over the, the other kind of format. The one other thing I'll point out is, you know, something like this CSV here, this combined CSV was three megabytes. If we did it as a JSON file, which is a different kind of data format that's pretty popular in a lot of different um, areas, that's, that's seven megabytes. So that actually doubles in size because of all the redundant information that you add to make it a JSON file. So um, basically what I'm saying here is all of these are simple formats and open formats, but some of them are actually more efficient than others for storing large amounts of data. So these are all things you want to think about as you kind of get into the, to the business of how, how do I want to store this and what tools do I want to use and what kind of formats do I need to deal with. Again, for a really small project, not a big deal, but if you get to a really large project, a lot of data, some of these are gonna present problems for you. 
I did want to point out a couple of other kinds of things that are out there. Um, if you're in the fields or if you're in fields that do a lot of modeling, um, particularly climate modeling or hydrological modeling or any of those kinds of things, there are formats like HDF and NetCDF that are fairly um, industry standard for a lot of, of uh, scientists in those fields. And they're specially designed to allow efficiency across really large scales, including multi terabyte data sets and things that are just enormous. Um, so learning how to work with those and use those tools are pretty critical to making those kinds of data um, more, more easily accessible to others, but also um, to yourself. And, um, and it, basically they're superior formats for these kinds of data sets. Um, what I don't want to do is suggest that these are the only options. Um, there are lots of other kinds of databases out there, um, and you probably have heard about some of these. Um, so if you, if you feel like your data is going to exhibit a couple of characteristics, you might want to look at some of the other kinds of, of databases that we categorize as NoSQL or not only SQL databases. So if your data is likely heterogeneous in nature, meaning you have lots of different data types, so you have images, you have spatial data, you have time series data, you have unstructured text like documents or, or letters or, or anything like that. Um, combining those unstructured, semi-structured, and highly structured data are really hard to do in a pure relational environment like, a, like an access database. Um, often you need something else. And so there are other tools out there. There are graph databases. There are things called document databases, which are really good for imagery. Um, and other kinds of, of database systems that are worth looking at. And with that is also this issue of if you think that your data is going to change in terms of its schema, um, so the variables of interest are going to change, or you're going to get more or less granular over time. Um, one of the, the core problems with relational systems is the fact that you want to set the schema and then you want to add the data and work with it, but you don't really want to change the schema very much because it's a real pain. And so if you plan to, to have an evolving schema or kind of an open uh, set of variables, um, then you might need something else. And there are a number of different approaches to that. Graph databases are very common with that kind of data. But ultimately, your, your data model should be reflective of the problem that you're trying to solve. So by and large, for a lot of time series that we work with, um, spreadsheets and relational systems work really well. But if you're trying to, for example, analyze a social network, then organizing um, your data as a graph is probably more suitable because the tools you're going to want to use to analyze that graph or that network are going to require your data be, to be modeled accordingly. Um, so thinking a little bit about the problem you're trying to solve and how that relates um, has a big impact on which database choices you use. So, Lots of things to think about there. Uh, there are folks on campus, certainly uh, we here at the library are happy to try to advise on questions that you have. Uh, other groups like the Northwest Knowledge Network are, are pretty expert in a lot of database systems and they can also give some advice um, what you're thinking about. Like I said, I think the default should be spreadsheet or relational, see how that works for you. And if it doesn't, then kind of move into some of these other areas. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about storage next. Um, and you know, some of this is really just kind of helping us to think about what options are available. And we'll talk specifically about what options are available at UI. Um, just kind of the general types of storage out there. You've got your local storage on any kind of a device that you're working with, uh, laptop, PC, so on. Um, you can have network drive storage. So if you're working in a, in a cluster or in a lab group or in some kind of capacity where you've got uh, an attached storage system or a mounted drive. Um, if you work here at the university, the S drive is an example of that. Um, uh, cloud storage is increasingly common. And I think we're all familiar with, with the cloud option that we have here, which is OneDrive uh, and you know, the ways that that can be useful. Um, occasionally, you can have syncing problems uh, dealing explicitly with, with high Kind of read write activities. So if you're sending data into the storage and back out 
repeatedly, um, doing so over a wireless connection or something like that is not necessarily the best idea. Um, and then, of course, we have physical media, so different kinds of flash drives and external hard drives that we can plug in and and uh, and and uh, move data around on. And in that case, smaller drives are not always the most reliable for long-term storage. Um, although there are some external hard drives, I'm sure we're, many of us are familiar with them, that are designed explicit, explicitly for that purpose. Um, so here at U of I, you know, you have uh, approximately five terabytes of space on one drive. Um, and so that's a pretty effective solution to the vast majority of cases. Um, most people, in my experience, are dealing with data in the tens of gigabytes and at worst hundreds of gigabytes. Um, there are only some people that are dealing with, with more than that. Um, so for most folks, that's good enough. Um, there are also some other cloud options that are not university approved, but are certainly consumer options available to many. Um, Dropbox and Google Drive have relatively small limits for free users. Um, if you want to go beyond those, you're going to have to pay. Um, and um, there are some resources like the Open Science Framework, uh, which is a, a foundational, or a, <laughs> it is a, a group focused on providing uh, kind of data management support to scientists and academics. Uh, it's supported by nonprofit foundations. Um, and there are uh, quite a lot of interesting things about it. They have a relatively small, similar to, to Dropbox and Google Drive amount of free storage. But it's also a mechanism for integrating your different cloud storage options, as well as um, working in private spaces with collaborators and then uh, publishing data out of that if you were, you were interested in doing so. Um, through other different groups on campus, uh, you may have other options. It kind of depends on your affiliation with different uh, labs and departments and, and so on. Um, through the Northwest Knowledge Network, um, you can pay for storage if that's uh, feasible for you. Um, at about, I think, $325 per terabyte per year. Um, so that's something you can definitely take advantage of if you're interested. Um, regardless of where you store it, uh, you're going to have to deal with the question of backing it up and uh, preserving it over time. And the sort of, um, the sort of key principle for backing up your data is this 3 two, one rule. So you want to have at least three copies of your data stored somewhere. You want to have two of them on different media. And you want to have one that's geographically differentiated from the others. And so what's nice is that um, using OneDrive and using cloud storage actually yields uh, two different copies usually, the computer that you're on as well as the data center where the data is replicated to. And that data center is also geographically differentiated from where you are. So using a, a cloud system of some sort, Google Drive is another example, um, can help you have copies in multiple locations. Um, if you need a third, then often a, a, an external hard drive would be an option for doing that. So the general idea is if something happens to your computer, your data is um, still available through one of these other options. If something happens to your cloud account, then maybe you still have that physical hard drive something happens to the hard drive, you've got it in these other, other ways. So, so thinking through exactly how you're going to handle the three, two, one approach is something worth doing. And um, I think everybody's, you know, probably here going to use OneDrive to some extent. But again, depending on volume, depending on issues of, of speed and efficiency, you might have to make some changes um, to how you can store things. If your data is too large, then you may have to partition it across multiple um, hard drives or multiple uh, different locations. So there are questions to ask that are unique to your project, um, but try to get as close to this 3 2, one rule as possible and you'll, you'll have data that's pretty much going to be preserved almost no matter what happens. Um, we we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, just folder organization and file naming. So kind of going from talking about data in the abstract is how, how do we actually manage it in an actual like folder context? And there are a couple of approaches, but really the one that, that seems to be the most consistently valuable to everyone is a basic hierarchical approach. Um, there are tools, Microsoft has built into Windows a tagging function 
Um, and reference management software also uses sort of tagging function. So you can tag files with certain keywords and then search on those keywords. Um, but by and large, I find that this is the mechanism that everybody uses. Um, and it's this, this principle of, of dividing things logically um, into folders, subfolders, and so on. Um, the, the pros of it, they're easy to use, it's clear. Similar items are, can be stored together logically. Um, some of the cons, it's easy to get too granular. If you're like me, you're super detail oriented and so you start subdividing and subdividing and subdividing until it gets kind of ridiculous. Um, this is particularly a problem when you're working with other people and you know they don't work the same way you do. So you need to find a happy medium with your team or with colleagues um, so it'll work. And the other issue is sometimes if you have too many subfolders and too long file names, you'll end up with a file ex or a file path problem where the actual name is so long that it actually doesn't work in some systems. So I had a colleague who ran into this not too long ago where she couldn't figure out why uh, I think it was OneDrive was having a problem. And it turned out that just the overall file path was so long that it was kind of having an error at one point. You'll also see this with things like R and, and Python and command line tools, that if you have to just keep working through all of these different subfolders and, and file names, it, it's more trouble than it's worth. So the, the alternative could be having very short names for everything, but another one may be not getting too granular, not subdividing your, your contents by too much. So ultimately, what you're really looking for is a structure that allows you to efficiently find what you're looking for. Um, in those folders and subfolders, you wanna put documentation and descriptive information with your data files so that you can find everything together. Um, different people have different uh, sort of categories that make sense to them and to their project. And so it may be that you have a kind of natural primary, secondary, tertiary, a division between the different stages of your process. It may be that you want to divide it by a subject or maybe a collection method that produces different data types. Um, maybe you want to divide it by time, you know, year by year or by space, this study location versus that study location. Um, and all of that kind of stuff is, um, you know, whatever works for the project that you're working on. Um, and then ultimately, you also want to remember to save your code in your reports uh, within the same context, but you want to you want to store them uniquely and independently so that you can find explicitly those elements when you need to. So it might be that you're putting them all kind of in the same um, couple of subfolders, or it may be that there's a code section and there's a reports section and so on and so forth. Um, so efficiency is the key, but you also want to think about um, making sure that it makes sense to you and to your team members if there are others. And then we also wanna talk a little bit about file naming today. Um, we just wanna sort of present the idea that the way that we sometimes name files, um, the way we learn how to do it is not necessarily the most effective for a number of different reasons and then there are other ways we can think about it. Um, so a file naming convention is sometimes the phrase used, and that's the framework that you define um, or that your team defines uh, for how you're describing and uh, naming the files in your, in your file system. So a couple of key points. You want to be consistent. You want to be descriptive. Um, you certainly want to think about it in the context of what does this look like to somebody who's not me? So you may have some abbreviations or some shorthand that you use that make a lot of sense to you. Would that make sense to other people? Um, this isn't just important in the context of, an, of um, a solo project. If you're sharing that data with other people after the project is over, they're gonna need to understand what those file names mean. Um, and then ultimately you wanna make it readable both to a machine, but also to a human being. So hopefully I can look at that data set or I can look at that file and I know exactly what it means um, and what it's referring to. But I also need to be able to read it into say R or Python or, or some tool. Um, and it needs to be able to read that file name without an error. Things with spaces um, and some of the ways we do things on particularly Windows PCs is not necessarily the most 
uh, appropriate. There's a really neat tool out there um, that will kind of make your life much, much easier if you are um, in a position where you have to do a bunch of file renaming or you need to reorganize things. And I just wanted to make sure folks were aware of it. Um, and it's called the bulk rename utility. And I'll just sort of give you an example of how it works here. Um, and this is the, the kind of folder we were looking at earlier with the spreadsheet and database files. And if you notice, they all they are all time stamped at the beginning. And let's just say, for whatever reason, I decide I really want to change that time stamp. So I can tell it that I want to replace you know, that date with something like that. And so in, you know, I can hit rename and everything will, will change. And depending on what I'm doing, um, uh, it, it can make my life a lot easier. And this also is a statement about being consistent with your file names. If you have patterns that you can uh, manipulate at scale like this, then it becomes much easier to use a tool like this to make broad changes that you need to make. So it's a really cool tool. Obviously there's a lot of power here that I'm not using. Um, but it's worth uh, being aware of and then you know, using in the context of file name issues. And so a little more on some of those points. Um, Timestamps, as you just saw, are really useful ways of just registering um, when that file was created or, or some significant date associated with it. And this will be, if it's in the file name, it's not that metadata that the, the operating system generates, which sometimes changes depending on whether you open it and hit the space bar and save it again or something like that. So adding that that timestamp helps you to keep track of when that, that file was, was actually generated or the time that it's relevant to. Uh, when you do things like this, use leading zeros, um, except at the start of the file name. So here's an example of um, we're using 01 rather than 1. And this just helps make the sorting process a lot easier um, if you're using the automatic kind of sorting features. Um, generally, it's just good practice not to use excessive periods. Um, for some reason, we've gotten into a process of occasionally using periods in file names in places that don't denote file extensions. So historically, the period is just for the file extension, and it helps a quick visual analysis um, to know exactly what extension that is versus what the file is. Um, typically, underscores are really good tools. Um, uh, underscores are really good uh, mechanisms for denoting spaces. If you use spatial data at all, um, it pretty much demands that you use underscores instead of spaces. And it's a way to keep the character string together so that the system is able to read that uh, without introducing the problem of spaces and quotation marks and all that stuff that happens in programming environments. So uh, try to do that. And then lastly, try to you try not to use uh, generic names like my data, first project, final data. I've got a lot of projects that are called final data, um, probably too many. And generally if we use a different approach, it's just as effective. So down here, for example, we have core samples version four. So if I version my data as I go through each kind of major step, the last version will always be the final data, right? Um, so that's theoretically a way that you can get around this problem. There may be other kinds of terminology that you can use um, to denote that. But when you do this, you make sure that your files are unique. You make sure that your projects are unique and it's very clear to people um, kind of what they are and where they fit um, in any projects. So, um, if you're not careful, you can end up uh, having a problem that looks something like this, um, which I think all of us have probably done something like that, and it's not fun for anybody. Um, something to avoid if you can. And with that, uh, I sort of covered what I what I planned to uh, in I think a pretty good amount of time for today. So I'm, I'm open to answering any questions or going back and talking about anything if anybody has any. Um, and I hope that was was useful. Looks like somebody saw the bulk rename tool and uh, that's gonna be really useful for them. So that's awesome. Um, and so yeah, I'd like to open it up to questions. 
um, if anybody has any.